Good morning and happy birthday. <laughs> 20 years old. Just thinking 20 years ago, I would have been about five or six years of age. <laughs> Except he ruined it telling you I've been married for 52 years. I had some association with your leaders early in this year, has been mentioned, and I was very impressed with the wonderful love and unity and harmony. There was no dominance, no dictatorship. It was just a wonderful experience to sit with a group of leaders running four campuses, and they're all supporting each other. You are a blessed people to have such leaders that have got you at their heart, not just themselves at their heart. How many of you reckon that's a good thing to have? Um, I believe we call this the Greater Springfield District. Boy, that sounds good, the Greater Springfield District. And this is an exciting day, and I am privileged to be here with you today, and I trust that the things that we'll share will be a help to you. At our, nas nas uh, sorry, at our national conference in 2005, we celebrated 75 years of our movements in existence. And for those who never had the privilege of going to our conference then, they had a huge hall right at the back, a big building. They called it the Hall of Fame. And in that Hall of Fame, there was all the records of the beginning of our movement, the little churches and the small numbers that we started off with and some of the people that were responsible for that. But how many of you know it's so wonderful to have a history of where you've come from because that helps you to know where you're going. It's healthy and it's very important to reflect there was a Roman statesman and a politician by the name of Cicero, and he made the following statement. He said, not to know what happened before one was born is to always be a child. I think I would suggest to you that he's implying there that you need a perspective and a mature appreciation of where you started in order to be appreciative of where you're going. And this would be a, a long session if we were to have everybody stand up and testify about what's happened in this church. But I was thinking in the past 20 years, the perspective and maturity of this church, I wonder, as I look over this congregation, but I wonder how many lost souls have found Christ that may not be here for many, many reasons. I wonder how many seeds of God's word have been planted in the hearts of children. I wonder how many sick people have been healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I wonder how many lonely have found solace. I wonder how many broken hearted have been made whole. I wonder how many captives have been set free. I wonder how many hopeless have found hope. I wonder how many sad and depressed, even suicide people have found love and joy and peace and direction and a reason to keep on living. I wonder how many teenagers have found meaning to their life and now are responsible and productive citizens, successful in business, mums and dads. And how about the wonderful thing that although they might have been on the brink of collapse, how many marriages have been brought together and are going strong because of this church, these leaders, and the wonderful work of Jesus in their life. And for that, we want to give God all the glory. The ministry of this church has a major contributing factor to the social capital of this community. Robert Putnam of the Harvard University has popularised this word, word called social capital. It refers to the glue in a community, the communication links in which there is trust and goodwill, which enables people to solve common concerns and achieve common goals. You know, one of the things about this morning is to realise that the political and the social needs in our movement, in our city, in our area, are our needs as church as well. We want to work together. We want to be a social capital for those needs in our community. Social capital contributes substantially to the quality of life. Where there is a high level of social capital, there are fewer psychological and physiological illnesses. Where people trust one another, business prospers, contributes to family life, decreases crime, enjoys people, people and community, and promotes democracy. That was by the guy Robert Putman. How many of you know we need more social 
capital in every city in Australia. And let me say that that's one of the things churches ought to do. We ought to be the glue of the community. We ought to be the life of the community. We ought to be the love in the community. We will never have too many churches. And I don't care what title they have, a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian. How many of you know if they love Jesus, they have the great potential for capital, real capital, social capital in that community they live. The work of this church contributes to this and many other communities and it's standing and honouring of Christ and worthy of much reflection. And how many of you know it is good to reflect but this morning, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just a retiring home of contemplative, all the wonderful retrospective memories. How many of you know this morning is a morning of a launching pad? where we go 20 years, thank God for those 20 years, but let's look at the next 20 years to be the great things that God wants to do for our life. Yeah. That's my introduction. <laughs> I have very long introductions, but real short sermons. You'll be pleased to hear that. I'm calling your attention to the story of Abram. It's a great lesson for where you're at, and I really felt it was significant that we read from Genesis chapter 13, verses <clears throat> 14 to 18. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, lift up your eyes from where you are. Ladies and gentlemen, lift up your eyes from where you are. Look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, say that, see. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Verse 17, go walk, say walk, walk. through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham moved, say moved. <laughs> I know this is important for you. He moved his tent and he went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Father, I'm just praying your blessing upon our sharing here. I pray that your written word that becomes your spoken word would become a living word in the hearts of these hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing that I draw your attention to is that God said to Abraham, look, lift up your eyes and look. How many of you know the disposition of the church should not be one of looking down, should not be one of despondency, should not be one of fear and unbelief and oh me, oh my, what's happening? And I'd like to say to all of us here, we're realists about what's happening in our society, but how many of you know we've got to lift up, we've got to take a positional change, a dispositional change, and we've got to look up and see what God's purposes are for our great nation. So I want to ask you, how far have you looked and how far can you look? Looking beyond, looking further, looking for new territories, looking for new lands, looking for new opportunities, looking for new leaders to reach a new generation. I was just so blessed to look around and see so many young people here this morning. At my age, John, almost everybody looks young, but how many of you know, it's great to see the young people here. And we need young people not to just come here to be helped, but we need young people who will rise up and become leaders and reach your generation. We need people here that have got a mission. Don't keep clapping, throw money if you like what I say. We need young people, but we also need people with new missions, new visions, new churches, larger facilities. How delighted I was to hear that you're looking for a physical place you can call home. How many know this is magnificent, but wouldn't it be great to have your own venue where you don't have to set up here every week like this? How many of you know, thank God for the volunteers that do all the work? I mean. Do you realise that in the next six years, 48% of pastors in our movement, in every church movement, the next six years, 48 will be at retirement age. By the way, that applies to police, teachers, blah, 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 blah. That's the baby boomers. They're on the way out. I can't wait to get up to that age. It must be fantastic <laughs> to know that you're on the way out. 
but here's the message, that's 50% in the next six years. We need these young men and women standing up and going, my hand's up. I don't want to just look back over the 20 years. I want to look forward and put my hand up and say, I want to be in that, lifting up my eyes and looking in the direction that God has got for us. Second point, to change is a challenge to see. If looking is enlarging our horizons and possibilities, seeing is focusing on the specifics. Most children look at birds flying and wish they could fly too. Sometimes they look at Superman on the telly and they get their mother to buy them a Superman cape. The not-so-smart ones get on the roof of the garage... And how many of you know they find the realities that gravity is much stronger than a cape and they finish up crashing to the floor? But how many of you know the difference there is that they look but few of them have specific and details about what they're looking at? And we want to encourage you this morning to have specific details. The birth of vision comes by seeing. It starts there. Orville and Wilbur Wright tell their story of how their birth for aviation took place. Listen to this story. Our personal interest in it, that is in aviation, dates from our early childhood days, late in the autumn of 1878. Now, I was a young boy in 1878, mate. (laughs) Our father came into the house one evening with some object partly concealed in his hand, and before we could see what it was, he tossed it into the air. Instead of it falling to the floor as we expected, it flew across the room until it struck the ceiling where it fluttered for a while and then finally sank to the floor. It was a little toy known to the scientists as a helicopter. But we, which were sublimely regarding of science, once it dubbed a bat. We called it a bat. It was a light frame of cork and bamboo covered with paper which had two screws in the end and in the middle was a rubber band that we wound up and it took off into the air. A toy so delicate lasted only a short time with the hands of small boys but its memory was abiding. Get it? They saw this thing take off, it hit the ceiling and that's there. And so we see... For the Wright brothers, they're looking at a toy helicopter, seeing what could happen, specifically possibilities, eventually become a living reality, and 25 years later, on the 17th of December, two, uh, sorry, 1903, at 10.35, Alber and Wilbur flew 12 seconds, <laughs> 120 feet. Aviation was born. Now, look at the fighter planes we have today. Have a look at the A-38. How about that? That magnificent bus. And I was reading about that Airbus that they said, it's seven storeys high. The wings are big enough to hold 70 cars. It can carry 853 passengers if everybody used economy only. How many of you know we're talking about a plane that's capable of 560 tonnes? Who would have ever imagined from that little cork, paper, bamboo, run by a wonderful thing called elastic band, seeing that out of there was the possibility of aviation. I pray this morning God will birth in the hearts of men and women here the possibility of what you've seen over the last 20 years is just a foretaste of what can happen in the future. Hip, hip. At least I have some friends out there. (laughs) For this church, vision is birthed by God in the hearts of his servants and leaders. Thank God for the leaders that you have. May God give them great visions and clearly burn it in their heart. I don't know whether you're familiar with the scripture in Proverbs 29, 18, which says, without a vision, the people perish. Let me give you an insight into what that is actually saying. The NIV says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. The RSV version says that there is no prophecy the people cast off restraint. The word vision, just stay with me for a second, 
Don't want to get too technical, but I need to put this down in your minds. The Hebrew word is causo. It means sight, revelation, or oracle. It corresponds with another Hebrew word called hazon, which is meaning of sight. The other derivatives refer to the revelationary vision that God granted his chosen messengers. W.E. Vine says, Corzone signifies and means a divine revelation or a prophetic vision. Believe me when I tell you, this is not just sitting down thinking of a good idea. This word means to have a prophetic, progressive revelation. We need leaders with prophetic, progressive revelation. That's why we cannot afford the luxury of just reflecting over the past 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be men and women that are burning with a passion for the next 20 years. That's prophetic. It's born of God. It's progressive. It's not just doing what we've done in the past. And it's something that really does have a great significance. Because that revelation will bring change in people's lives. The church has never been designed to just be socially connected. It should be socially connected. But the church has been designed to take Jesus Christ into the hearts of men and women and bring the transformation that only he can bring. How many of you know, I'm talking to people here that are not what they used to be. And they're not what they're going to be. There's people here whose lives would be an absolute mess if... Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel in their life. Oh, I'm getting a bit excited. I gotta be careful, I gotta be careful because my pacemaker might quit any minute now. Vision is seeing what God sees. In Numbers chapter 14, there were 12 spies sent out from Moses to see what God saw as the promised land. He said, go out and spy it and check it out for us. You remember the story of the land flowing with milk and honey? Ten came back. They saw the promised land, but how many of you remember? They saw the giants, the fortified cities, and they said, we're like grasshoppers. There were two guys... Joshua and Caleb, who saw exactly the same thing, and they actually rebuked this rebellious bunch. It tells us in chapter 14, verse 9, they said to these guys, we will swallow them up. And then verse 10 is fantastic. And then the people talked about stoning them. How many of you reckon if you're going to be a progressive leader, there's the possibility some might want to um, (laughs) replace you? I want to talk to you to be a people that hear the visions that the pastors get, your leaders get. Hear that that vision born of God and will you do one thing, will you get behind it 100%. You see, we need leaders with prophetic vision, but how many of you know we need people with prophetic faith? There has to be a prophetic faith. When we talk about the word prophetic, it means something you cannot see but you believe in it. How many of you know the whole of the Christian life is a faith down there? Yes, I'll be able to get back. How many of you you know the whole Christian life is a, a life of faith? If the thing that you call faith cannot fail, it's not faith. Think about that. We say, I've got faith in God for doing that. Well, how many of you know that means that there's a possibility of failure? When Peter put his foot over the side of that boat and stepped onto the water, how many of you know an incredible faith was exercised because he could have sunk? And here, I'm saying to you, when the pastors come up, when your leadership come up and say, this is what we feel feel God wants us to do, how many of you know we want a bunch of people... We can't see it literally, but we can see it in our spiritual minds. This is the direction God wants us to go. And we get with them 120% and say, let's do this. Amen. Amen. Walt Disney's wife was called Lillian. You would have remembered that prior to Disneyland being opened, Walt Disney passed away. It was at that great opening that the MC was introducing Lillian Disney to make her speech. And in the introduction he said, (laughs) imagine this, what a pity Walt wasn't here to see this magnificent facility. She got up later and she said, actually, he did see this facility, that's why it's here. (laughs) 
How many of you know we need people who can see a change, see the future, make the difference? Thank God for your Lord Mayor. What a brilliant visionary this man is. Pulling up computers when he probably didn't even know how to operate one back then. <laughs> but how many of you know what a visionary to do things like that? And they're the people that we want to have leading our church. It's so easy for us to see all of the giants and fortified cities. We could be petrified by the ongoing effects of the GFC, the financial gloom and doom. We know it's real. We could be perplexed by the giants of humanistic philosophy that are stealing our nation from God's truth. We could be perplexed. I'm sorry, we could be intimidated by the Gen XY generation who could be disillusioned by the failed church disgusted by the church and the sexual abuse of children. We could be shocked at our society's indifference towards God and blinded by secular atheistic philosophers who want to crucify Christ again and get him out of our society. We could become discouraged as we see the younger generation searching for a truth in a maze of postmodern secular ambiguity without a moral compass. We could choose to go down and see all those giants and fortified city, or we can choose to see our God and see how great our God is and hear the church say, yes, we're realistic about what's happening out there, but we can swallow them up. Yes. You're scared to clap now, aren't you, just in case. <laughs> Psalm 24 says this in verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it, the world and all they that live in it. God is still in control of the nations, ladies and gentlemen. God is still on the throne. God can see and knows what he wants to do and he wants people to go, God, I can't see exactly what's going to happen, but my faith and confidence is you. We can see new leaders for a new generation. We can see more missions, more schools, more churches. We can see more ministers in our community. We can see increasing facilities, seeing more. We can see in the church released, not to have full-time ministers, but every attends the church and knows Jesus Christ. They are the ministers. Yeah. Ephesians 4 says, God gives apostles, prophets, pastors, and teaching evangelists for the maturing of the saints for the work of ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the ministers in this church. These people, hang on, these people are paid to be good. You're good for nothing. <laughs> Yeah, they really clapped at that one. <laughs> we could describe Abraham as an example for us as follows, and I'm quitting now. Vision. He looked, he saw, because God took an initiative. Christ had a great vision for his church. Go, take the good news to everybody. Chuck Craft is a former lecturer at Fuller Theological Seminary, a linguistic expert, a missiologist, he says, that Matthew translation said, go into everybody's world. Go into all the world said, he said it could be gone, it be read like this, go into everybody's world and listen and communicate the good news. You don't have to have a credential, a theological degree or a seminary background to go and tell people the good news of what the gospel is about. Jesus transformed your life. How many of you reckon that's one of the best arguments you can ever have? Yeah. There was a blind man in the Bible and they said to him, who did this? What happened? Blah, 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 blah. And the poor bloke said, look, I don't know. He says, this I do know. Once I was blind and now I can see. How many of you know that rattles most people? I don't know what's different about you, Bill, but what is it? Well, I can't explain it, but God came into my life Christ changed my heart, my marriage was in a mess and now I'm on a good road going the right way. I don't know what happened, I was on drugs and my life was a mess. I came to this church, I found Jesus, I can't explain it but it changed my life. I don't know, I was a violent person, I couldn't control my temper. I came to this church, Jesus came into my life and I'm a changed person. How many of you know all they need to hear is your testimony? to tell them about Adam and Eve and the dinosaurs and who rode on whose back. You don't have to explain everything. How many of you know if you can tell them the good news that I'm telling you, once I was blind, now I am seen, they can't argue. Yeah. 
with your responsibility. Second thing I saw in Abraham, he had a passion that flows from seeing the possibility and moved out of his society. We need churches that are passionate about our condition of our society. Look, I'm not here to be negative, but how reckon we're on a slippery slope in this nation. Our marriages are falling. We're having a violence, not only domestic violence, we're having street violence, we're having major problems with crack and drugs like that. How many of you know it's time the church got passionate to reach the lost community? We have got to stop locking the doors and saying, keep them out, they'll make the place dirty. We've got to start saying, open the doors and help them to become clean. We've got to be people that start reaching out and taking the good news out there with passion for them. They're wonderful people but have been misguided. They're wonderful people who've made bad decisions. They could be victims of abuse and everything else in their family upbringing. How many of you know the only hope in their life is Jesus Christ? Please get passionate about that one. Second thing, third thing, he had his great conviction. He didn't understand it all. He said, he heard the voice say, go, and he just went. How many of you know, you've got to have a conviction about what you believe. If you haven't got a conviction, you'll easily be discouraged and distracted. But he had a conviction, God had spoken to him, and God wanted to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, you've got a wonderful conviction that you have, not only a God who looks down in heaven, not only a Jesus who did it all for you on the cross and now is at the right hand of the Father, but you have got a person called the Holy Spirit living in you, abiding in you. He's there with you. He is the power of the Godhead in you on this planet Earth. Do you have that conviction? Or is it just a religious thing that you hold? And finally, he was motivated, acting out of his conviction to where it was. And how many of you know he, as a mighty man, had very much human mistakes, very much human limitations, just like you and I, but he went out and did what God wanted to do. You see, determination is undeterred by troubles. Destination is when people are transformed by Christ. And we need to be people that take that with us all the way. So I'm asking you, church, as we come to this wonderful celebration and we look back over 20 years... And I look over this congregation and I say, oh, thank God for all that's happened. And this isn't all that's happened. This is only a representation of what has happened. But can you open your minds to say, what could happen in the next 20 years? Yeah. If we could just see the possibilities. Because you know what? In Christian churches, there is no lack of clientele for what we have to offer. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? There's no lack of clientele that are out there. There's people that are looking for Jesus, but they don't know they're looking for Jesus. Last illustration, station, quitting. If I could say illustration properly, I'd quit now. <laughs> I went to pray for a man whose wife was working in our coffee shop. I'll call him Bill in case he's in the meeting. The point of asking Bill if he would mind if I prayed for him as he was going in for an operation for cancer. And I went like this. I said, uh, look, Bill, um, I know you're not a religious man and you know that I'm a minister and we pray for people and God does miracles sometimes in people's lives. And I said, Bill, would you let me pray for you? Now, how many of you know you can wait for a few seconds and hope that you get a good response and it might be, ah, cut it out, mate. I don't want any of that junk. You take a religious. And How many of you know he could have been that? But this is what he did. He went, oh, mate. He said, I saw a bloke on 60 Minutes and he said he was born without arms and legs. His name's Nick V. He said, he was the happiest bloke I've ever seen. No arms, no legs. And he said, I thank God for my life. He said to me, if you've got anything like that, pray for me. <laughs> listen, listen. You've all got something like that. Yeah. It's called Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of our generation, the hope yeah. of our cities, the hope of our nation is Jesus Christ, the King of glory.